二三年，中国经济关键数据亮相，亮点何在 ？China is unique because the economic competition between provinces is fierce, and the competition between Chinese firms and global firms is fierce, and that creates what I call a very efficient, competitive Chinese system. 中国经济增长提振全球经济复苏势头。If China does grow, let's say five or six percent, there are some estimates that suggest that it would account for about one third of global demand this coming year, and that's significant. 两会召开之际，美国经济学家黄玉川热议中国经济复苏。风云对话特别节目正在播出。三月五日，中国国务院总理李克强向十四届全国人大一次会议做政府工作报告，用一系列数字勾勒出今年中国发展主要预期目标。政府工作报告提出，今年中国国内生产总值 GDP 增长百分之五左右。二零二二年，中国经济受疫情等超预期因素冲击，最终 GDP 同比增长百分之三。不少国际组织和机构都预计，今年中国经济增速有望强劲反弹。那么，拉动中国经济高质量复苏的火车头有哪些？这些火车头又该如何有效驱动？两会期间，风云对话邀请到了曾担任世界银行前中国业务局局长的资深经济学家黄玉川，剖析2023年中国经济关键数据，聚焦中国经济发展。Good evening, Dr. Huang. It's great to have you back on Talk with World Leaders. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Let's focus firstly on China's economy and economy recovery.、Um, China's economic agenda, undoubtedly for 2023, is going to be focused on growth. After China relaxed. Its epidemic prevention and control policies. Many institutions have raised their forecasts for China's economic growth this year. What are your expectations and observations on this? Well, the International Monetary Fund about a month ago raised its、uh, forecast for this year to 5.3 percent. Many investment banks, like Goldman Sachs. Have also increased their forecast this year to above five percent. The question is: Is five percent a optimistic, realistic, or actually a conservative estimate for this year? On paper, five percent sounds pretty good, but we have to remember that last year China's GDP growth was only three percent, so you have a very low base. Let me remind everybody that if you go back to the pandemic 2020, China was the only economy. That had positive growth and was two percent, so that was a low base. The following year, 2021, it grew at eight percent because two percent was such a low base. So this time, we're moving from three percent to five percent. The increase is actually not that ambitious. There are some in Beijing who are arguing that the growth target should be six percent or even more. So now we have a range. Six percent may be what I consider optimistic. Five percent. Maybe actually even still a bit optimistic. It may even be as low as four percent, and that's because we face a great deal of uncertainty, much more uncertainty than we have faced in the past. What do you think the main driving force for China's、uh, this year's economic recovery? Well, export growth in the last couple of years has been a significant contributor to economic growth.、Uh, of the three percent growth rate, for example, over last year. Uh, export growth was probably one to two percent, so it was very, very significant. Investment has traditionally been a major driver, but that has basically slowed down because of the property market. So what people are hoping for is that consumption will be the primary driver, accounting for well over half of GDP growth this coming year. So essentially, those are the three aspects. The fourth、uh, aspect is indirect, and the indirect aspect is whether China becomes much more productive, better use of its resources. And that's that would require what I call efficiency gains and lots of reforms. So some people talk about whether reforms will actually step up, and whether that will boost the growth rate of the economy. 经济学上认为，一个国家的经济发展离不开投资、出口、消费三驾马车
，着力扩大国内需求是二零二三年中国经济工作的重点任务之一，强调把恢复和扩大消费摆在优先位置，多渠道增加城乡居民收入，稳定大宗消费，推动生活服务消费恢复。And what do you think are the short-term and long-term challenges facing the economy, other than the uncertainties well, some, you mentioned? For some people, they think that the key is consumption, because China's consumption has always been relatively low. But I think they're actually mistaken. Consumption never drives growth. Consumption comes from growth. Households will consume more if their incomes go up, and their incomes will go up if productivity increases. And then productivity increases, incomes increase, consumption increases. So you really can't say Chinese households should consume more. They will consume more if they feel like it. Now there are some who believe that there will be a burst of additional consumption this coming year because they op they observe that savings rates of households increased rapidly over the past few years, but they've actually misinterpreted the information. What they see is that the deposits in the banks, the household deposits in the banks, have soared, and therefore people think there'll be a burst of consumption. But the increase in household deposits comes mainly from wealthy households, who actually、uh, gave up their、uh, wealth management products, pulled the money from the equity markets, and they put it into the bank accounts. These are not the individuals that will actually consume more. If they do anything positive, they will invest. So they are potential stimulations of the property market. But the ordinary household members, they're under a tremendous amount of pressure. So I think that the consumption factor is probably going to be overestimated in terms of significance. So the real issue for China is: can it actually increase productivity? Can it use things better than it has before? And I think this is a major uncertainty. How do you think? China's economic performance or economic recovery is going to have、uh, an impact on the global economy this year. Well, this is a very important factor, and of course, it's very important to the rest of the world. If you go back to the global financial crisis, you know, go back ten or fifteen years, China's growth essentially helped the globe, the world, to recover.、Uh, China's growth at that time. Accounted for 50% of global demand. That's a huge boost. Without China's growth, the crisis, the recession after the global financial crisis, probably would have lasted another two or years longer than than it did. So now, if China does grow at say five or six percent, there are some estimates that suggest that it would account for about one third of global demand this coming year, and that's significant. It will show up. up Largely in the energy markets, because the recovery in China will be mostly in services, travel, commuting, transport, increasing demand for oil and energy, and then global oil and energy prices would increase. If the property market rebounds, demand for building materials, iron, steel, minerals, copper, that would also surge. So a strong growth in China would boost up commodity prices, and energy prices. And I think that would be helpful, particularly to developing countries, because developing countries, many of them, are the main suppliers of, of commodities and the kinds of building materials that China needs. Yuquan is Carnegie International Peace Research Institute Asia Research Director, focusing on China's impact on the global economy and its impact on the world. He was also the World Bank's Chief Financial Officer, and is the head of the World Bank's Asia Development Bank, Asia Development Finance Bank, and the World Bank's Chief Financial Officer. He was also the head of the World Bank's Asia Development Bank, Asia Development Finance Bank, and the World Bank's Chief Financial Officer. He was also the head of the World Bank's Asia Development Bank, Asia Development Finance Bank, and the World Bank's Chief Financial Officer. 发表了犀利的看法
Dr. Wong, you uh, mentioned a lot of these points you raised in an article at the end of last year named uh, China must abandon successful but outdated policies to revive economy in 2023. And you said in that article that China enters the new year facing more economic uncertainty than it faced in decades. But there is a path that can steer it clear of pitfalls. Would you please share with us what would this path be? And what the pitfalls well, would be if ask, not followed? Okay, if you go back and ask how did China manage to grow at such high growth rates for several decades? And the major driver was essentially urbanization. So over the last 20 or 30 years, China's urban population increased from being 20% of the population to 60, 65. And because they moved to cities, this led to housing boom, construction boom. Now we have a uh, situation where the pace of urbanization is slowed down. Construction cannot be the major driver of growth. You cannot count upon rural migrants coming to the cities and becoming more productive. That's what happened three decades ago. So if you cannot follow that path, you have to follow a different path. And this different path requires you to become much more efficient. You also mentioned in this article uh, that China needs a properly functioning global economic system to, uh, to prosper, given that it is a major trading partner with more than 100 countries in the world. And therefore, constructive engagement with China on economic issues would offer a path to a less contentious dialogue on more sensitive security issues for the Western countries and Western powers. Would you elaborate, please? If you go back 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you realize that the so-called global economic system was essentially created and supported by the United States and Western Europe after the wars. They were in favor of globalization, free trade, movement of people, resources. Today, we have something quite different. The U.S. favors protectionism, tariffs, restrictions, and no longer is in favor of what I call free trade, the movement of capital. Yet countries like China, developing countries, have now become the advocates for freer trade. So why is that? Well, we know that China's economic success comes from its trade and investment relations with all the major economies in the world. It's the major trading partner for 100 countries. It's the second largest recipient of foreign direct investment. It is a manufacturing, the most significant manufacturing nation. So China's prosperity requires what I call a rules-based international system to function. We don't have that right now. The WTO cannot enforce the regulations. The courts which support the WTO don't have enough judges because the United States refuses to appoint them. You have unilateral sanctions and policies coming up. And these are hurting China and it's going to hurt the developing world in general. And therefore, what I basically say, uh, well, here I am in Washington in the West, your best means of getting a what I call more constructive discussion with China is recognizing that China supports a rules-based global system. You have certain concerns, but those concerns China recognizes issues that need to be resolved. And if the West approaches China in a constructive way, then I think these issues can be handled in a normal international multilateral situation without the need for sanctions and restrictions. Dr. Huang, you once said China has never been an ordinary economy. Obviously, it hasn't. Uh, but the doubters can easily get this wrong. Do you think this statement still applies in 2023? It's never been uh, similar to what I call the normal kinds of economies that we're familiar with in the West. It's, it comes basically from the fact that this is a socialist uh, economic system. So the key resources are owned by the state. So the challenge for China has always been, if the resources are owned by the state, how do I make sure that they're effectively used? So China's been very good in figuring out how to deal with that problem. And it comes from competition. It subjects Chinese firms to global competition through trade. It subjects domestic firms with competition with domestic firms in other provinces. So China is unique because the economic competition 
between provinces is fierce. And the competition between Chinese firms and global firms is fierce. And that creates what I call a very efficient competitive Chinese system. And this was the, the, the issue in Eastern Europe. They didn't have these competitive pressures, so they didn't succeed. Even when I look at India, and when I ask, why is it that India is not doing as well as China? The answer is that Chinese companies are subject to more competitive pressures. Indian companies are protected, and therefore China does better. So understanding this aspect uh, comes to a key issue. This competition is actually good. It also brings up global growth. But the world has become a little bit concerned. If China is so successful, if its companies are so competitive, then you have what I call these US-China tensions. And we have to understand the nature of that relationship and actually figure out how to, how to deal with these issues. 二月二十四日，二十国集团 G 二零财长和央行行长会议在印度南部城市班加罗尔举行。美国财长耶伦再次对华释放积极信号，寻求与中国恢复对话。I don't have a specific time frame in mind, but、um, I believe. It's important to do so. 而此次 G20 财长会议是在美国国债有违约风险的情况下召开的。一月十九日，美国财政部长耶伦正式致信国会，表示美国政府债务已破三十一点四万亿美元法定上限。他警告称，如果国会无法尽快达成共识，一旦债务违约，很可能演变成一场毁灭性的灾难。然而，目前美国国会在是否提升债务上限这一议案上存在较大分歧。有评论认为，随着近年来美国政治极化加剧和两党分歧加大，债务上限已成为两党之间围绕关键政治议题进行博弈的一场闹剧。所谓的债务上限，从来没有真正限制过美国政府的债务膨胀。Let's、uh, look at the U.S. On January the 19th, the U.S. Treasury、uh, has already reached the current debt limit of、uh, 31, some 31 trillion U.S. dollars. So it has no room to borrow under its standard operating procedures, other than to replace maturing debt. And to avoid breaching the limit, the U.S. Treasury has begun using extraordinary measures that allows it to continue to borrow additional amounts for a limited time. What does a national debt default means for the U.S.? Well, most、uh, policymakers and、uh, would, and most politicians actually agree that a default would be disastrous. It would jeopardize the strength and value of the U.S. dollar. So, realistically speaking, a debt default, everyone would say to themselves, it's not going to happen. The consequences would be too deadly. So, you've gone through these cycles periodically for the last four or five years. Each time, just before the deadline, some understanding or resolution is reached to either postpone the problem or to solve the problem. Now you have what I call a very difficult issue.、Uh, the issue has become very politicized. Who is responsible for the fact that the deficit, the government deficit, has surged so quickly in the last three, four, five years? Well, the answer is both Democrats and Republicans contributed to this. Trump passed a major. Tax reduction measure, which lowered revenues for the government. Biden has passed several expenditure measures,、uh, one to finance encouraging、uh, production of semiconductors, and the other one oriented toward supporting clean energy technologies and climate change initiatives. So you have increasing expenditures, at the same time, cuts in revenues and taxes. So the U.S. deficit is soaring. Some. Some knee-jerk reactions were:、uh, the Democrats have proposed that the very rich segment of society—I'm talking about the top one or two percent—these are people who make, let's say, a hundred million dollars or more and pay no taxes. Okay, so you would have thought it had been obvious that these people should pay some taxes. Okay, but they don't pay; many of them pay no taxes. But that could not pass. There were some people who objected tax, even people who make a hundred million dollars. That's one extreme. Now the other extreme is medical costs in the health system in the United States extremely costly, more costly than any other country. So there's a legitimate question: Why is it that health costs in the United States are so much higher than they are in Canada, Europe, 
And people would say, we're not clear at all that the health services are any better. So it's, it's focused in terms of the, the insurance systems in the United States. So again, there's a so-called obvious problem. The way insurance policies, health insurance policies are, are structured in the United States leads to a lot more waste than it does in other countries. But these are both politically extraordinary sensitive issues. Yet for many people who look at it, there's obviously something unique in the sense that why is America so different from everybody else in terms of some of these policies? And yet we're unable to reach what I call a, a politically acceptable solution. But that's the challenge for uh, the US government and, and it's been postponed for too long. And Dr. Kong, moving back to Sino-US relations, the, this year marks the fifth anniversary of the Sino-US trade war. And yet in 2022, bilateral trade figures hit a new high. What do you think of this? Do you think this is some sort of uh, positive signal? You know, when President Trump launched the trade war, he basically said the US-China trade deficit is too large. I want to put tariffs on China. I want the deficit to become lower. And then Biden continued the tariffs and he added trade restrictions primarily on high-tech products. So here we are four or five years later, the US-China trade deficit is the same as it was four years ago. And as you mentioned, the trade levels between China and the United States in terms of exports and imports they're essentially the same as they were before. So one could easily conclude that the tariffs, the restrictions didn't accomplish anything, but that's not actually correct. Um, US-China trade is more or less the same as it was before the tariffs, but US trade with other countries has actually increased more proportionately. So the share of America's trade with China has actually declined. So the U.S. is trading more with Europe. Uh, in Asia, it's trading much more with Vietnam, for example. Uh, in the West, it's trading much more with Canada and Mexico. So U.S.-China trade has not changed much. Trade war didn't change that. But the growth of trade is now showing up in other parts of the world. Now, if you look at China, China's trade with the United States has also not changed too much, okay? But China's trade with Europe, South America, Latin America, and Asia has soared. So China has become the largest global exporter, record levels, but not because of exports to America, but because of exports to the other parts of the world. So the irony is that US-China trade relations have more or less stayed stable, but both sides have increased the trade with the other parts of the world. And then we have to ask, is this good or bad in some way? When, in one way, it is bad. When they don't trade with each other, it means that they're not getting the most efficient outcomes and best prices. So there's a cost, and that cost is higher prices for everyone. So when we talk about inflation, inflation in the West, part of that is driven by the fact that both China and US are sort of like buying products from others, and they have to pay higher prices. And therefore, their households and producers have to pay higher prices. So this is what I call trade diversion. Trade diversion has a consequence. It forces everybody in the world, including Chinese and Americans, to pay more. So you pointed out the fact that the trade war or trade relationship not changed much. And I would say it didn't change much in absolute amounts. But the consequences actually are quite significant for everybody. But it has changed in the core. And Dr. Huang, I think uh, some of the things you mentioned just now are also signs of uh, decoupling. Um, a lot of people like to use that term these days between China and US, uh, especially in the fields of uh, high technologies. How do you think this is going to affect the economic and trade relations between the two countries, other than what you mentioned just now? The, the big question is how far can this decoupling proceed? And the answer is that you're talking about the uh, largest two economies in the world. They have an extensive trade relationship with each other. So full decoupling is not possible. There will be what I call selective decoupling in certain areas. And it may be largely in high tech product lines, but not in all. For example, computers, laptops, smartphones produced by Apple, 
There's no tariffs on those products. The second point I would make is who wins in this process? And the answer is both sides lose. Both sides will suffer because of these tariffs and restrictions. And then if you, you, if you think about it, essentially it's because security concerns override commercial decisions. When security dominates commercial decisions, then you lose economically on both sides. And the American economy depends upon technology to grow. China does not actually. China can grow from doing many things, but America only grows from high technology. So a United States, which grows, let's say at 2% a year on, on average, if it only grows at 1%, has a serious problem. So many people in the United States tend to think that this trade war it hurts China and maybe it hurts the United States, but they actually think that China will suffer more and the answer, in my view, is it's different. It's the difference between the short term and the long term. But the basic bottom line is everyone suffers. So the IMF came out with a study about a couple weeks ago, actually. It estimated that global production over the next uh, medium term would fall by anywhere from 7 to 15 percent because of these restrictions. And that's everyone affected. And who would be affected more than others? Well, the ones who would be affected more than the others would be uh, more integrated or globally connected economies, that means the richer economies, as well as the Asian economies, because they're the target of the trade war. So the big losers in a global way are both the West as well as Asia and Asia-China. But the costs are very significant, actually, for both sides.